Listen, the housing affordability crisis in the United States is bad, but do you see what their neighbors to the North Canada are experiencing? Nah, that is worse. See, I'll break it down for you so that we get on the same page as we begin this video. Back in 2010, several Canadian cities were ranked among the best 10 cities to live in globally by the consumer news and business channel, CNBC. Actually, since 2008, just over 15 years ago, Canada has enjoyed a relatively brilliant system of financial regulation. That's across low inflation, low interest rates, periodical oil-driven economic growth, and more importantly, exploding house prices. This housing appreciation has turned many working people into millionaires. And yes, it was that massive. However, now in 2024, we seem to be dancing to a completely different tune. Only one or two of these cities are left on the top 10 ranking, and with the look of things, they might as well slip off. An insanely high number of people in Canada don't have access to housing that meets their needs and that they can afford at the same time. The current situation in the northern neighbor of the United States of America is characterized by a surge of homelessness, seeing thousands of Canadians and people living in Canada getting priced out of real estate markets, and, in worse scenarios, left to live on the streets of this wealthy and once very happy nation. Now, at least one out of every two homeless people can be found in Quebec. This used to be the case for Montreal before, but now Quebec? This points us to one answer. The virus is spreading very wildly, and undoubtedly, Canada is becoming overwhelmed with this housing crisis. Rents have risen sharply, home prices are skyrocketing, the shortage of affordable accommodation is cute, the list is literally endless. And as we must have expected, this housing crisis is causing generational conflict, eroding the welcome nature of Canadians, straining the social fabric, and many more. So yeah, how can Canada fix this crisis? In 1951, an average Canadian house was about 1,000 square feet in size and comfortably housed four people. But in 2021, despite the average house size increasing by an extra thousand, the number of people it can house has shrunk to almost half. This means there are 60% fewer houses than in 1951. And that exactly is the primary reason we have a housing shortage and ultimately crisis in Canada. If the Canadian economy slips into a recession today, the housing market catastrophe is just one of the leading factors to blame. Breaking down the situation even further, the simple arithmetic is that demand has left supply behind by light years. Canada is just not building enough houses. But of course, this is a wealthy nation, so what must have happened? Why have people not been building for decades? Of course, we need a quick fix, but let's try and find the root cause of the problem first. A Concordia University economist, Moshe Lander, carefully describes this situation, which I think is the perfect answer to this. Canadians haven't been building enough to meet the demand because of the government's control housing policy that is considered biased towards renters and homeowners. Low interest rates is another leading cause of Canada's housing crisis. Canada is one of the very few countries that are keeping interest rates very low. Other countries, including the United States of America, are all raising their interest rates, but Canada just loves to be different. Somehow, there is a direct relationship between property bubbles and lower interest rates. Low interest rates allow people to borrow more than they logically need, and when everyone has access to money and purchasing power increases, the pricing bubble automatically continues to inflate, as people are always ready to buy regardless of the price. Remember, they already have the money. But now that the global economy isn't exactly smiling and people are fearful of not having a repeat of what happened in 2008, it seems deflation has finally found the better part of this bubble. But beyond all of these, many people have found a way to blame immigration for the Canadian housing crisis. And this may be somewhat plausible when you consider it on a surface level. Now, look at it this way. The Canadian government is significantly easing its immigration restrictions, a process that started rather gradually in 2022. A recent report reveals that the government is allowing almost 4 million immigrants to relocate legally to Canada every year. Beyond the population explosion that we'll discuss later in this video, many of these new immigrants are coming into Canada via the Paid Immigration Program, where people are expected to invest about 1.2 million in Canadian bonds to obtain Canadian citizenship. So yes, Canada is attracting some of the wealthiest immigrants, but is this enough? Clearly not. Especially because of the darker side to this coin that many of us don't actually know about. A better percentage of these immigrants come from countries like China. Now, the problem with China is the high level of corruption. Corruption is estimated at a mind-boggling sum of 86 
billion dollars per year. But thankfully, the Chinese government have been doing a pretty good job of confiscating the money. However, while it's good news for the Chinese, it's actually somehow bad for Canada. Because the Chinese government is likely to confiscate the corruption proceeds, these corrupt, supposedly wealthy officials pump the money into the Canadian economy without restrictions. And one of the sectors that have suffered the hit the most is housing. These immigrants have no regard for the fundamentals of the local housing market, as what they're after is channeling their money into a safe haven, a place that the government of their home country cannot access. This is a ripple effect. These immigrants have the money and are mindlessly driving real estate prices high. Sadly, local Canadians cannot compete with them and are getting displaced from their homes as a result. It's now become the survival of the fittest, and boy, these locals are not competition worthy to the amount of dollars these guys are pumping. Ironically, not only the locals are at the receiving end. Immigrants who aren't a part of the scheme are also suffering for it. These people come into Canada in search of greener pastures, but are met with situations greater than they can handle. And somehow, they are also a part of the big picture. Despite being unable to compete with prices, they still have a slight advantage over the locals and are renting in very large numbers. I mean, they are coming in large numbers too, so what do you expect? Indirectly, they are also driving the prices of real estate up, although not as high as their wealthy immigrant counterparts looking for a safe haven for their money. Now, this is where we need to look beyond what meets the eye. A lot of this other category of immigrants are international students, and somehow they have been an easy target for scapegoating. But that isn't right. In fact, comparatively, they do more good to the Canadian economy than their contributions to the housing crisis. For example, international students are estimated to contribute more than $22.3 billion per year to the Canadian economy, and are a major source of the talent and workforce needed to tackle the shortage of labour. So, despite the blame game, the facts are clear and bare to our faces that Canada actually needs these international students too. Therefore, the truth is we can blame immigration all we want, but it only makes us fall further into the rabbit hole. There is much more at play than the newcomers and their associated effects, including mindlessly pumping money into real estate, higher demands because of the population explosion, and so much more. Blaming all of these only draws our attention farther away from the roles of developers, municipal zoning laws, and the active impacts of the government itself in perpetuating the housing crisis. See, we can go all around, touching variable, plausible, contributing factors, and we wouldn't be wrong. But to what end? Thankfully, there seems to be a glint in this tunnel. The Canadian government is reviving the wartime home strategy to address this housing crisis. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has recently revealed that his government is cracking the history books open as its latest attempt to address the severe shortage of housing the country faces. This wartime strategy includes a catalogue of pre-approved home designs targeted at reducing the time and costs required to build housing. Now, the big question is, can this wartime strategy be the lasting solution Canada needs? Well, to answer correctly, we'll need to take a quick trip again down memory lane into the Second World War. See, this is not the first time Canada has experienced the housing crisis, and when it first happened was far back in the 1940s, when thousands of soldiers returned from the Second World War and needed shelter. We'll use Toronto as the headline sample. When these soldiers returned to Toronto after the war, housing was scarce. Before the war, the development of housing in Toronto was haphazard, with plots of land held by prominent families in the cities from time to time, ranging from the railway titans, the wealthy banks, and so on. The outbreak of the war made things far worse, with many people relocating in troves to the cities, consequently increasing the demand for housing in those places. But just when you think things were already worse, the haphazard nature of housing was looking to take a more terrible turn when these soldiers returned forcing these titans to sell off their holdings from time to time and subdivide them to create temporary wood frame houses called victory houses. More than a million victory homes were constructed between 1946 and 1960, with some of them still standing to date while some couldn't stand the test of time. This humble design, beyond helping to solve the housing crisis Canada suffered post-war, also changed the way houses were built in Canada. Now, the year is 2024, and the Canadian government is seriously considering bringing back this strategy to save the country from losing its face as it battles with a severe housing crisis like in the 1940s again. However, of course, this new intervention program will differ from what was used back then in a few important ways. According to the Prime Minister, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation would look for designs for multiplexes, mid-rise buildings, student housing, senior residences, and other small to medium scale residential properties. 
This pre-approved construction would still be tied to existing building codes, reduced power bills, and builders would still have the option to build using their designs. In a very recent statement by the Housing Minister, Sean Fraser, Canada is revisiting this wartime strategy to unclog the pipeline at every step of the way to create an extremely faster construction process using cost-efficient, labour-efficient and energy-efficient designs that are going to allow us to build the kind of homes that will solve the housing crisis more quickly and more cheaply without compromising on quality. This programme is billed to begin somewhere in January this year. So what do you think? Is this the best approach Canadians need right now? Is the Canadian government truly in the right direction? See, the housing crisis in Canada has hit a critical juncture, and the ripple effects only continue to worsen. Is the wartime strategy a temporary resolve or the permanent fix to get Canadians out of this mess? Don't hesitate to share your opinion with us in the comment section below. We'd love to hear from you. We've now come to the end of the video. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel to enjoy more videos like this. Bye for now, and see you in the next one.